I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition or episode, rather, of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. As always, I am Amy, and with me, as always, is... I am Jason, and our guest today is Mr. Rob Hingley, known by thousands of people all around the world, uh, simply as Bucket from the Toasters. Buck, it's fantastic to see your face, my friend. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, well, what what happened to uh, Idaho, Ace? I have to get <laughs> Well, I'll have to, yeah, tell you that whole story. But uh, it's now yeah. it's now official that uh, we're in we're we're back in Phoenix. So this is this is our home okay. base once again. So Boise was uh, temporary, and we've now officially solidified that we're back in Phoenix for good. So the the circle is unbroken. Yep. You got it. We had to do All that. Right. Well, let's let's get into the beer, guys, because that's an important part okay. of starting this show. So, Amy, yeah. why don't you start? What are you drinking today? I this is this is very fitting. It's the uh, Sky Brewing Modus Hopper Andy because a friend of mine gave me this, and I couldn't. I've been waiting for the right moment to open it, so I'm excited to crack this today. Well, and you um, said interestingly that in so Amy's in California, she's in Los Angeles, and you said okay. it's it's difficult to find Sky Brewing in Los Angeles, right? I have never seen it. That's so fascinating. Well, a friend, a friend well, of mine found it and gave it to me, so I don't know where he got it. I think he had to track it down at like a fancy liquor store that has fancy beers. Yeah, I can, I can give you an update. So on I would that, not. Actually. Sure okay. They have um, Scabroon is now selling in in um, in California, and there is a rep who's in the LA area, uh, and you can um, I will uh, dig out her number and and send it to you. So is that very, is that a recent she, thing? They just they just started distributing there. Um, I think they've been selling into SoCal for a while. Okay. And uh, in fact, what they had done is uh, they had drawn out of North Carolina so they could basically take care of bigger markets closer to home. But uh, but it now is uh, available in your area, Amy. So uh, I'm going to hook you up with that contact. So you never need you never need to be without scab brewing again. And how um, how how apropos that I chose the scab brewing, the modus Actually. modus. Um, which has uh, basically got a hint of um, orange peel in it. I'm going to crack it now because I've been sitting what, look, looking at this for the last 20 minutes. You don't want yeah, it to get warm. It. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the odd man out. Uh, I don't have a Scott Brew today, but I do have a uh, Deschutes, a Pacific Wonderland nice. Lager. We've talked about Deschutes oh, on the show before. Yeah. Deschutes, fantastic mm-hmm. brewer out of Oregon. Good stuff. So that's what I've got. Let's crack them open. Hands. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Well, cheers, everybody. Cheers. And let's, uh, Thanks for having let's me on your show. Talking some weird nerd stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. This is this is exciting to talk to you. Um, so one of the things that we we do on this show is that we we try to get into people's sort of hidden nerdery and things that they're passionate about, but maybe people don't know about. And one thing I, Jason and I were talking about earlier was that you used to own a comic book store. Uh, I didn't. I didn't own one, but um, I was working for Forbidden Planet. Uh, okay. Which is which is a name that um, is much better known in the UK than in the US. But that's the reason I, I originally came to the States in 1980, anyways, to work for them. Uh, and my area of expertise was uh, basically collectible comics and science fiction books, horror, uh, pulp magazines, um, antique toys, that kind of stuff. So that's my uber nerdery right there. And um, basically, I worked at Forbidden Planet until about 1987, um, and that's how uh, basically I jumped off into into the band from there. So I stopped being a science fiction nerd uh, in 1987 and completely became a, a scan nerd. Officially. So really, it was it was like a band aid right off. You were you were done science fiction. No more done, science fiction. Ska now. No, it was, it was a little more graduated than that. Okay. I mean, what happened after? Um, I mean, the band started in 1981, and it was basically going along. But by the time that um, Joe Jackson had produced that uh, EP for us in 1985, and we really got national attention and national distribution, and then the Skaboom record came out in 87, uh, which we had to tour not just nationally but internationally at that point, then there wasn't really time for me to have a job anymore. Um, and so at that point, I was completely out of Forbidden Planet. But I'd been kind of part-time with them on a consultation basis 
which like meant maybe taking a ride out to Long Island and, and finding a bunch of stuff to look at in somebody's basement or garage um, since about 85. So by 87, I was completely uh, scar nerd and, and no longer a science fiction nerd. If I had to make a clean break. Yeah. Do you ever really drop the science fiction nerdery, though, or is that still something that you, you know... No, of course not. Engaged uh, with. <laughs> like, like, for example, I was, my, my daughter's a huge uh, Star Wars fan, so we were talking about the new movie and the return of Luke Skywalker just this morning. So, it's, there you I mean, go. Once, a, once a nerd, always a nerd, you know. Fantastic. It's like, malari- it's like malaria. Once you're bitten, I mean, you can never get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anybody make a yeah. less favorable comparison to loving science fiction than malaria, but it's probably a good one. <laughs> well, I have malaria. It doesn't leave your I, blood. I, I had malaria too, so that's uh, I happen to be knowledgeable on that subject. All right. <laughs> I, 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 got the, go... I got the malaria in 1962 in uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. By the way, if there are any health nerds on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you have both. Pre ska and uh, post ska in your life, um, mm. basically been a world traveler. You've you've been all over the world, and I know something that is near and dear to your heart is beer. And you've had the opportunity yeah. to to sample beer from all over the world. So I've got to ask you about every, about everywhere. beer. You've had every kind of beer there is from everywhere that makes beer. So much. if you had to be stranded in one place, and that place like separated or blasted off into space or something, and you had to be stuck with that one one beer that one location's beer for the rest of your life where would you choose um believe it or not colorado that makes because, sense uh, because it's a great place for beer um and the scabbering guys are there but also one of my other favorite beers of all time is uh dale's pale ale okay which is which is one of their they they say it's not a competitor but one of their contemporaries should i say um but colorado really if you think about it um that's a great um, concentration of beer, even though it's not Beer City, USA, uh, which is Asheville, Carolina, North Carolina right. now. Did you know that? Yep. Uh, I uh, only Matt know Hager. that because I have friends who live there, and when they told me that, I didn't believe them, so I had to look that up. It's hard oh, to it's... imagine North Carolina with anything, but you know, anything good like beer. Well, they have pretty good vinegar-based barbecue sauce as well. If you're a, a barbecue, yeah. a barbecue. This is nurse. what I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> But um, when Asheville, North Carolina was voted Beer City number one, uh, the people in Portland, like, like Matt Griffin, Ace, you know Matt, yeah. uh, from Sim- Simmerdam Productions, uh, was extremely pissed off because Portland, Oregon had been Beer City for like year upon year before that. And now it's Asheville, North Carolina, which is not a very big town at all. Blink and you miss it, but you know, there you go. But they have good beer there, I suppose. Well, and there's an explosion of beer absolutely everywhere. I mean, San Diego's a huge beer beer town now. And yeah. have you tried, Buck, have you tried the, the Ballast Point uh, makes a habanero beer? And I know you're a fan of habaneros. Yeah, I've had that. And um, number one, it's too expensive to to be anything more <laughs> than, than a foible. Yes. In a sense. Uh, but I had to try it. And I, I was a little bit disappointed. So... It's better for me just to have a beer and eat a bowl of habaneros, which is what I, which is what I get to continue to do. It's that's, cheaper. That's a good way to go. Yeah, that beer is yeah. so expensive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is amazing that my Target sells it. I think it's it's, uh, it's called the sc- Target. It's called the Sculpin, I think, isn't it? Yeah, the habanero Sculpin. Yep. Yeah. Jason, you tried that recently, didn't you? I did. For the first time. What did you think? I was really excited for it. Because I love I love the spice and thinking about that paired with beer, I was really excited. But number one, it was already um, not looking good for me because it's a it's an IPA basically, um, and I am not an IPA fan. So the fact that it had the, the hoppiness to go with it really wasn't exciting me from the start. But I don't know if it was just the the batch that I got or whatever. It wasn't all that spicy, Amy. Got to say, I know you, yeah. you hyped up the spice, mm. and I just didn't have the spice in mind. So. The lack of the spice plus the excessive hops, I, I was both sad and happy about that because I really wanted to love it because it sounded great, but I didn't want to love it because it's so expensive. So, Yeah, I, I get that. Right. But the, the thing is, I'm a bit of a beer purist coming from, from Britain, as I do. Um, I, I'm a big fan, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of uh, everything microbrewing and craft brewing, anything that basically erodes the power of the, the piss water manufacturers 
Like, by the way, so, mm -hmm. uh, let, let's not mention their names. They don't even need to be uh, acknowledged as beer makers. I'm going to bleep that but, out. But I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's good craft beer and there's bad craft beer. Um, and I think uh, I'd be much happier for people to make like a really good, say, pint of, of, of British bitter than stuff with pumpkins in or cherry blossoms or whatever. Uh, and I think a lot of people overflavor the beer um, as a result of the fact that their basic product quite often isn't that good. So Got to doctor it up with something, yeah. Having said that, I'll still drink a, any kind of craft beer over a Budweiser any day of the week. Do you have a favorite Scott Brew? It is pretty bad. <clears throat> <laughs> My favorite Sky Brew um, used to be um, uh, Pinstripe Ale because that's kind of like going back to what I said earlier. That's about as close to a pint of Yorkshire bitter as you mm. can find here in the states. Um, but now it's this uh, Modus Mandarina. It's just got me really hooked. And in fact, I have a, a I have an eighty six pack in my fridge outside. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds kind of awesome. An eighty six um, pack. I didn't even know you could get an 86 pack. <laughs> well, you can when you've got the well, hookup. I guess well, it, so. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in fact, I'm going to see if I can dig out this girl's. Uh, well, actually, it's not on this phone, it's on my other phone. I'm going to have to get that for you. But um, I'm sure that as a result of this promo opportunity, the, the area rep will come around and, and uh, bring you some beer, Amy. Like I'd, a, be, I'd be into like, that. <laughs> like, an, like an assortment. Yeah, because this is good. This is the first time I think I've ever had this beer, and it is quite good. I do it's like pretty, an IPA though, so sorry. Jason. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Pretty. It's, I, I think um, Modus Operandi is one of their like top six staple staple yeah. beers. Well, you've uh, so worked you with. Oh, that... Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, just because you mentioned, and I have not thought about this until right now, that no one really makes a good pint of beer in the U.S. and they just kind of over flavor things. Is that an American thing? I have not really drunk excessively outside the country in a long time. Is that an American thing to say like pumpkin spice beer and then cherry blossom beers and just sort of like mask the fact that beer here isn't necessarily that good with like, yeah, I'd, I'd say so because the, the same, it, I mean, to my palate, cause obviously everybody has a different taste and they're, you know, different strokes are different strokes. And I don't want to really, you know, put other people off what they like doing. But I find the same with American wine is that um, there's too much taste in it a lot of times. And one of the reasons that derives from is that when they, they age the, the wine in cask, for example, they put some artificial flavorings in there like um, the burnt flavor. So what is it they put in there to do that? Um, basically, they, they add things to make give it more flavor. And instead of the wine just imbuing with the flavor of the wine in the cask, they accelerate that with some uh, flavor fires, and, that, and and so the the wine tends to have too much taste. And the same thing is with the beer. So, I, I think less is more in a sense when you're elaborating, uh, particularly wine. So I prefer to like drink Spanish wine than, than American or even French wine. Actually, Spanish mm -hmm. wine is better and cheaper. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I'm sure whatever Americans put in their wine to accelerate it is probably toxic. I found out the other day that, you know, the little cuties oranges are so small mm. because they are soaked in uh, toxic runoff water. But the mm. FDA still allows it. So that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, started... um, we can just talk about, I mean, let's talk about citrus now. Let's be citrus nerds for a second. And uh, I lived in Spain for 11 years in Valencia, which is where you guys get most of your orange stock from anyway. Yeah. And but the lemons there, I had a lemon tree in my backyard, which is probably about 150 years old. And if you left the lemons on, which grow all year round, by the way, it's not like a biannual crop like oranges. Um, these lemons would be the size of softballs mm. and the skin would be about an inch and a half thick. Yeah. But they were the best tasting lemons ever. But when you get a lemon in a supermarket in, in uh, USA, they pick them small and they mature in the refrigerated rail cars coming from wherever they're coming from california or florida and they spray paint them yellow because otherwise they'd be green so i mean there's lemons and there's lemons and there's oranges and there's oranges and there's real things and there's fake things but we buy food in the supermarket because it looks like a lemon not because it really tastes like a lemon yeah hmm. I know. Are you with, are you, are you with me? <laughs> Uplifting. No, my, my thought on that was just that is the most 
Talk about never wanting to go to the grocery store ever again. Yeah, it's when you start thinking about where your food is coming from, it gets quite sad <laughs> when you live yeah. in a major city and don't have access to a backyard to grow your own produce. But yeah, sorry, Jason, what were you gonna? I was gonna say jump in uh, with one there? of the things that I really miss about our old house that we had in Tempe before we moved to Boise. Um, we had a lot of grapefruit trees, but my favorite tree was what they call a cocktail tree. It's a, a hybrid lemon lime tree. So okay, yeah. half the year you'd get lemons, half the year you'd get limes. That's a thing. And they would get the lemons would be just like you described, these gigantic lemons with thick skin, but the best lemons, they were so good. Yeah, well there you go. So um well thick skin is a good thing. I've learned that after forty years in the music business, having having <laughs> thick having thick skin. Like an elephant, it's a very good thing to have. So, yeah, no, that's that's good to know. And you know, I, I mentioned habaneros, so let, let's go into hot sauce now because I know you know a thing or two uh, about hot sauce too. And it's funny because yeah. with beer, um, you know, you've Scott Brewing did a, a special toasters beer for you guys. That was awesome. And when was that? That was so long ago. Now that was like your twenty fifth anniversary, or was it the thirtieth? Yeah, that's the twenty fifth anniversary. And it's actually, I don't know if you ever saw the video that they put out. Uh, having to do with that, it's like called. I probably uh, did. It's like beer masters. It was like a little yes. spoof they put out. Yes. It had the guy. It had the guy from um, a beer minions. It was called, and it had the guy from um, Dogfish Head doing a cameo in it and everything. If you don't have it, I'll, I can send it to. You. If you send me your email address later, Amy, I'll send you um, a couple of MP3s with, with that. It's pretty funny, and that's mm-hmm. just um, that's just uh, the whole story of how they came up with the toasters beer by like burning toast, et cetera, which is not how they made it. <laughs> but they actually did, they actually did physically deliver to the launch pad in, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They delivered us 80 cases of beer, which we managed to stuff into the back of the sprinter uh, in uh, basically defying the, the laws of like uh, dimensional laws of, we discovered the fifth dimension <laughs> to get that extra case in there. Um, but I have one bottle left. That's actually I'm looking at it right now. It's up on my up on my case. So I think anybody who has one of those is a valuable collector's item at this point, because I they just made that they I, made that one run and that was it. Yeah, I think I still have my bottle. I'm not sure. I don't know. If, I don't remember if it's full or empty. I think it's full. But... Are you sure it's full? You didn't drink it and put the cap back on? I'm not positive. I'll have to check. But uh, mm-hmm. so you've you've also gone into the world of hot sauce too. I mean, I. Yeah, some of the two two greatest things: beers and hot sauce. So, you had toasters, hot sauce too, and you had a couple of different runs of that, haven't you? Uh, well, we're up to the third flavor right now, and uh, how we got into that? I mean, I'd always um, seen, for example, Kevin Lyman had one for the he was doing for the Warp Tour about ten years ago, but I didn't really like that because that was one of those hot sauces. The same as we're going back to the beer thing and the purity, where they'd obviously got some hot sauce and to make it extra hot they just like whacked a bunch of extract in there hmm. and when and when you taste a sauce like that you can differentiate your palate can differentiate between the taste of the hot sauce and the taste of the extract so yeah. you can tell it you can tell immediately it's fake but we um we got turned on to this through my son actually um started hmm. working for this guy in in denver colorado again so all roads lead back to denver inexorably uh, and he's called Danny Cash. We'll give him a plug because he's got a great, um, a great thing going on there. And he um, came to a show in Denver with a, a huge case full of about 60 different hot sauces that we tried. So we basically were driving around on tour on the West Coast with um, just, just with a, a case of hot sauce and chips and just sampling them all. And so now we have three toasters hot sauces. One is uh, the Shocker, which is a smoked filthy habanero. Uh, the second one is uh, the razor cut, which is a, it's like a um, Caribbean lime flavor. And the third one is a Cajun, like a raging Cajun, they call it. And that one's called the Scar Killer. So that's like a hot one. Mm. But the, ne- the next one is going to be a yellow habanero sauce, like over the top, which would be called the East Side Heat. Wow. But they're all named after toaster songs, obviously. Yeah. Just to be nerdy. That's perfect. I love that it. Makes, yeah. makes a lot of sense. I've awesome. only had one. I've only had the, the first one. The chipotle. Ch- ch- I have to. I, I'll hook you up next time I see you. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And it, it, I've noticed a lot of bands doing hot sauces now, and I imagine they just 
you know, get some some sort of company to put a label on it for them. But I know you guys actually go through a tasting process and decide the flavor you want. That's awesome. Well, the guy, this guy Danny Cash in uh, in Colorado, makes all his sauces and and he has no extracts, no preservatives, no 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 weird stuff. It's just it's just like honest to goodness hot sauce, which yeah. tastes good, and he private labels them. So basically, I mean, there's a minimum order. You have to get like a few dozen bottles, but we don't really have a problem. You know, what whatever's left after the toasters get at it, we can sell to the public. But uh, we actually sell more hot sauce and CDs now, if you can, if you can get there. Right? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we don't have a problem with people da- downloading it on the internet either. There you go. Oh, man. Yeah. If you could download hot sauce, figure that yeah. out, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 3D print hot sauce at home? <laughs> yeah. It probably tastes, probably tastes like shit, though. But you can <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't be great. But um, interesting. That's when did you make the transition to selling more hot sauce than CDs? Um, like, like the, I feel like, like the, the digital age has has killed so much music sales. Uh, don't get me started on that. That's going to be had <laughs> to be a whole separate program. But it, it has. I mean, really, what um, the digital age and and providers like uh, Spotify and Pandora and all these guys have really trivialized the. Um, the, the content to its point of view where, where kids don't even own it anymore. They just rent it, you know, mm-hmm. they just basically have this biggest jukebox ever. Mm-hmm. And it, it was at the point now where kids, <laughs> kids don't collect music. And there was been a little bit of a backlash against that uh, with the resurgence of vinyl right. where pe- people are mm-hmm. kind of figured out and say, wow, this is cool and it sounds good. But when you think about it um, and this, my kids do it. So I know exactly what I'm talking about is they will go and download an MP3 uh, which they'll listen to on their phone. And that's the way they consume their music, which is the antithesis to quality. And I think when kids actually get a vinyl um, LP and put it on a decent sound system and listen to it on a turntable and speakers, they, they get so blown away that it takes them to another planet. Yeah. So there's a, there's a link into the ufology there that they can basically transcendently go up to a higher plane simply by listening to music as it should be listened to. Yeah. And instead of disposing of it like some piece of toilet paper after they listen to it once. Pretty off horrible. But Spotify is my, my enemy right now. That uh, guy Daniel X. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. I mean, you, amazingly, after, what, 36 years now with the Toasters, um, you're constantly on tour. So, I mean, you've had a good <clears throat> view around the world of audiences as they've come and gone over the years. So mm-hmm. are you seeing the same thing uh, in terms of or equating to CD sales as attendance at shows? Is it down that much? Uh, well, it's two, it's two different things. And, and um, you kind of have to separate one from the other. Um, back in the day, bands used to tour to support albums. Right. Uh, and now it's, it's the mirror image of that where uh, bands go on tour and, and use albums to support the tour at the merch table. Um, so the basically industry has been stood on its head and bands that can't tour um, are in, in big trouble, basically, uh, because their incomes have dried up. That's why you're seeing so many, uh, I call them dinosaur acts, but other people call them heritage acts. I guess I should be careful because I guess I'm, <laughs> I, I'm nearing that definition myself. But um, those bands are coming back out of retirement and getting back together because all their, their income checks have dried up from the record company, so they yeah. can't rely on sales of their back catalog anymore, so you have to get out and play. Fortunately, I saw that happening in 1998, uh, when we got whacked at, uh, back when I had Moon Records. Yep. Uh, when, I, when I saw what Napster did to uh, back catalog sales, which basically is what killed the label. Um, and so at, at that point, um, we decided to set the Toasters up as a global touring band, and, and basically put the record releases as just a platform to put gas in the, in the fuel tank. Um, so we retooled up early for that, and it's worked out for us, but other bands haven't been so lucky. Is... Last, year I, last year I played 227 shows, uh, which I haven't played that many since I was on, uh, on the Miller Band Network in 1991, by the way. You're, you're playing the role of a young man. Wow. Yeah, yeah, well, um, hopefully I'm playing a little bit better than I feel it. <laughs> but, uh, 
head is no, just but it's constantly like, moving. Yeah, and it's what you got to do because if you don't uh, if you don't play, you don't you don't make any money. Yeah. And you know, and unfortunately, I still have two kids in college, and uh, I didn't have a mortgage, but I'm about to have another one, which is I don't really want, but that's the way it goes. Now. Yeah. And so there you go. So uh, you know, if you and people say to me all the time, it's like you know, I'm I'm going to start a bank. Can you give me some advice? And I'd say, yeah, you know, as trite as it sounds, don't quit your day job. Yeah, the, no. music, the, the, the music business is not is not what I would recommend anywhere to anybody to seek a career in at the moment. How is the uh, I guess the ska scene? Um, looking at ska music in other countries, is there a difference in its current reception in other countries um, than it is right now in the U.S.? Um, yeah, and I think um, I mean. The ska scene is huge in places where you wouldn't really think it was, like Mexico, for Mexico, example. Yeah. And uh, I was just reading this morning that um, they're going to have a problem because two of the bands which were uh, going to uh, headline that big... Um, the Pepsi-sponsored festival? Well, the, the reggae festival in uh, California, Pantheon Rococo, oh, yeah. uh, and Anti-Doping can't go because they're not, they're not getting their visas. So Are you serious? Have... I'm going to that show tonight. They can't get there? No, they they, wow. they, they can't get in the country. Oh, what so, is wrong with this country right now? Well, I, I, <laughs> I mean a lot, but that's a separate. Well, don't, <laughs> don't get me started on that. That's a that's a whole separate program. <laughs> I'm gonna have to come back. I'm, I'm gonna have to come back on another show. Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll, we'll get really drunk on that one, and we'll, we'll just rage about politics. Yeah, right. we've got we've got a, a a Brit, a Canadian, and an American talking about U.S. politics. That'll be fun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Wow, yeah, that's got to be... I never thought about that, actually, about how the scenes moving between countries, because being in L.A., there's a huge Mexican ska scene that I only know about because I will just buy tickets to a show that sounds fun without knowing the bands. They're always Mexican bands, and the music is so great, and it's so much fun, and I never thought about the fact that now now they can't make their money. Yeah, and to, um, and to a certain extent, the two scenes are mutually exclusive, where... where... Mm. I think um, the the Mexican kids will go to the the white boy shows, but the opposite is not true. And um, some of the best shows we've done in uh, California recently have been in the East Side. Uh, this guy Clemente, who's in that band uh, Sector Core, you, you know them, mm-hmm. um, puts on these shows and and they're, they're ram. But a lot of the a lot of the kids from the valley won't go there because their mother and father say it's too dangerous or whatever. Yeah. But, Huh. But, but it's it's kind of fucked up because if you think that there's a way to really, you know, cross pollinate the cultures and and make pe- make people realize that you know not all Mexicans are rapists like Mr. Trump would have us believe, then just go to their show and see them having a good time. But some of the biggest bands, uh, like that band Inspectora, for example, um, they're having problems with their visas too. Um, so who knows what's going to go on with that? Yeah. You know. Interesting. But, yeah. Hmm. But if you want to know where, where the most ska fans are at the moment, is in Indonesia. Indonesia. Really? Indonesia. Mm-hmm. I would Which never is, have thought. <laughs> but it's, it's the third. It's the third biggest population on the planet, which is predominantly Muslim, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, but um, I think uh, when I break down our um, in in Facebook, we can go. You can take a look at your band likes and see where we're all from. And Manila, Philippines, is uh, number one at the moment. That's incredible. Yeah. Also surprising, though. Yeah. yeah. But Indonesia, generally, we played in Jakarta about three years ago, and it was it was pretty crazy. But uh, so the ska scene has gone to places like there. It's gone to places like Malaysia, uh, Japan, everybody knows. Um, but Mexico, I mean, who knew that that's basically ska central right now? Do you ever... I know it's a weird thing to think about, but do you ever think... If you hadn't started the Toasters in '81 and started Moon Records, um, which what is really this, large, this is a what if, a what if scenario, largely you know deserves the credit for bringing ska to the U.S., getting the the attention on ska in the U.S. How much do you think that would have affected ska around the world? Because not to be egotistical, but the U.S. does influence a lot of uh, cultural aspects around the world. Yeah, well, I always saw, I mean, I had a theory about that. Is, um, basically, they were, 
the, the, the hub for ska music in the world used to be London. Uh, and they had this label there, for better or for worse, called Unicorn Records, um, who had a reputation for ripping people off. But nevertheless, he um, got a lot of releases out all over the world. And um, in, in a sense, it works like uh, spokes in a wheel. Um, and there's places like uh, Venezuela, for example, or Argentina, uh, or a lot of other South American countries who who really tuned into what we're doing at Moon Records. And one of the seminal releases we put out for them, we put a we put out a Latin Go Ska compilation, which was all South American bands, uh, and that became the mecca for a lot of those guys. In mm. fact, you know, when I go to Colombia or Puerto Rico, people are still talking about that. You know, 30 years later. Wow. So those those kinds of things are really are really important. Um, and in a sense, that's that's why some of like the satellite scenes, say in Germany or or Italy or or wherever, are never really going to assume the importance of of what happened in London or what happened in New York. And that's that's just historically the way there is. So, yeah, I'd say I mean, looking back on Moon Records is an important label. We sold one and a half million records, which is quite an accomplishment. You know, yeah. um, that was accumulatively, but still, I mean, for um, you know, getting laughed out of the offices of uh, producers and the record labels in New York in 1981 saying, I'd never get anywhere with that s- circus music. I think that kind of proved them wrong. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that's a true story too. Uh, yeah. The guy from the guy from the, the music critic of the Village Voice at the time, his name was, let's see, uh, Robert Criscow, said he would never review its hostess record. So thanks very much, and that, but here I am. <laughs> I wonder if he still has his job. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I know you've so. got to run, so we are going to wrap up with a question we give everybody at the end of our show, and that is this. So we're going to go back to your sci-fi geekery for a minute. And uh-huh. if you had the ability, technology was there, you could basically snap your fingers and magic would happen. You could visit anywhere in our solar system, any moon, any planet, anywhere in the solar system, where would you go and why? Um, I would probably, uh, I would probably go to, uh, one of the, uh, star, the, the Star Wars worlds. Um, I'm not quite sure which one, but uh, I probably want to go check that out. So, um, cause I'm into that kind of, uh, Star Wars steampunk approach to science fiction, you know? That's awesome. You know, you could also yeah. go to, you could also go to the moon and start moon no. records again. Yeah, not much going on up there. I'd, I'd have to. I'd, I'd go up there and start Earth Records. Earth Records on the Moon. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Earth Records on the Moon. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Buck, this has been fun, uh, as you alluded yeah, to. We'll have to come back many times over to talk about because there's so many topics we could talk about. But uh, thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. And uh, Amy, hit me up, and I'll I'll dig out that rep with the scab brewing people, and uh, I- that that way, um, I'm, they're they're really nice people, and I'm sure they'll hook you up. I certainly will. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So here's where we just asked: Do you have any places on the internet where you would like for people to be able to find you? We will put links to the band and everything. But are you guys social media that people can follow? Uh, well, we have a Facebook page, but I'd, I'd much rather have people come on uh, on the website. Uh, because there's more cool stuff and, and less yeah. stupid advertising. And that's www.thetoasters.band. All right. We'll put all that link. And Jason, awesome. where are people going to find you? Find me at Acentric on Twitter. Um, also on, let's see, I don't know, just Google me. I'm everywhere on YouTube, also at Acentric. And uh, yeah, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram is all Acentric. And I think on Facebook, I'm the UFO geek, but I'm not entirely sure. So there nice. you go. I don't think I knew that. And right. website, and always course. Rogue Planet. You can go to rogueplanet.tv, find this show and all sorts of UFO stuff. Beautiful. And of course, if you are watching this on YouTube, you are at my YouTube channel. So you know that I do all kinds of weird space stuff. And you can find my main channel, Vintage Space. There will be links below. And you can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at AST Vintage Space. So be sure to chime in in the comments and let us know, guys, if you have other questions that you would like us to ask back in a future episode, if we can get you back on, or if you have other beers that you would like us to try, or just other things you want us to take on. Leave all that in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we shall see you guys next time. Thank you for stopping by. Thanks. Cheers. Bye, guys. Thanks.